Welcome to High Ridge Church Online. Here at High Ridge, we are a family of churches, and our hope is to help people know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. We have a lot of things going on at High Ridge Church. The best way for you to get the details you need for every event or ministry is on highridgechurch.com. You can also connect with us on any of our various social media platforms. If you have never joined us at one of our weekend services, we would love to have you. You can find directions and service times for each of our campuses online at highridgechurch.com. We encourage you to lean in with anticipation for what God is going to speak into your life. Thank you for joining us online today. Well, good morning, church. Man, isn't it a beautiful day today? Come on now. You survived the storm yesterday. Man, I'm so glad you're here this morning. Well, hey, before we get into the word this morning, um, I want to do my last building update. All right, this will be the last update you hear um, until we build a new worship center one day. Come on, somebody. All right. Um, but hey, so as you can tell, we got all the carpet in. Um, thank you again for all the volunteers and all those that helped kind of make that happen. So we got all the carpet in. Um, there's a few little things that we still need to tidy up this coming week. Um, the biggest thing happening this week is we are painting all of our kids' rooms. Um, if you're a parent, I don't know if you've noticed that the kids' room don't kind of match everything else that we have. Well, there's a reason for that. And so we're changing that this week. We're painting. I think we're going to have volunteers showing up for that. And so um, if you don't have anything to do this week and you'd like to show up, I know Grace would love to have you. And so just follow us on social media to get more information about that. And so um, the parking lot, did you guys notice the parking lot? That's my favorite part. Come on, man. So listen, I, the orange stripe and all that, I was like, man, that'd be really cool if we had a black parking lot with the orange to match our logo, all that kind of stuff. And so um, if you don't like it, please don't tell me. And um, But uh, man, I'm excited. And um, I can't get into all the thank yous um, that should go out as a result of all this that's happening. We did this in six weeks, guys. Come on now. We did six weeks. We, we knocked this out. Um, we've added a 192 chairs once we get them all in. Um, so right now in this room, we have 400 seats, which is already 100 more than we could fit before. Um, and then we still have 100 extra chairs that we can put in here. And so, again, it took our capacity to over 500 seats. Um, and here's the reason we did this. Um, and, and some of you have asked, well, Pastor Zach, okay, now that we have enough room, are we going to go back to one service? No. And let me tell you why. Here's why you need to know that. The this rule of thumb is for church in most buildings that um, where you have an event, when you are at 80% capacity of your seating, you're full. Here's, a, here's another way to put it. If you look around, you'll see some, there's some ones and there's some twos and maybe some threes, but when you have a family of five walk in, you can't split them up, right? So the rule of thumb is at 80% capacity of your worship center, you either need to remodel or you need to move to another service. So the reason we remodeled is because we were getting close to that 80% capacity on one of our services, and I don't want to do three services. Can I just tell you right now, all right? I got some energy, but I ain't got that much energy. And so um, we decided, okay, let's go ahead and remodel now and prepare for us to grow over the next year or so. And so we now have the capacity to grow to 1,000 people on a weekend with two services with this remodel, all right? And so isn't that awesome? Come on, somebody. So we still have some time. Our, our, our average for the past 12 weeks has been about 590 on an average weekend, um, but we've hit over 500 people um, four or five times already this year. And so um, I, I see by the fall, by this time next year, we could easily be at that, and then uh, we're going to start building over next door, okay, because I don't want to do three services, and we want to reach more people, so... But anyways, that's a building update for you guys. And, and again, if this is your first time, this is just a, a business meeting, if you will. This is what our business meetings look like here at High Ridge Church, me just informing you where your money's going and what's happened. Um, and, and I do, is Darby in here? Darby, does she already rock out? Does she share the win from Habitat? Okay, I'll share the win. So uh, this yesterday, <laughs> believe it or not, we actually had a group of volunteers go and work on the Habitat for Humanity house here in Graham. Yeah, I don't know if you remember yesterday, the wind was like tornado, cold and raining. We had some volunteers, come on somebody, that went and helped build a house for somebody. So listen, here's what's incredible about that, and here's the reason I'm telling you. Um, I always try to inform you where your money's going, okay? And I always told you, man, if, if you'll trust God with your finances, I will do everything in my power to make much of his name. Not High Ridge name, but much of his name. So yesterday we had this group of volunteers go and work on this Habitat for Humanity house. And the lady that we're building the house for is there and prays to receive Christ. Come on, somebody. Is that incredible or what? 
So not only are we making a difference out in our community, God is blessing our obedience and changing lives, and that's what it's all about, amen? That's what it's about. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, I love you guys, and uh, man, I'm excited for next weekend. You guys excited? Woo! So listen, I, I told you last weekend, if you missed out, um, last weekend I started preaching on uh, the, the parable, and again, if you're new to church, a parable is just a metaphor. Jesus spoke in metaphors, if you will, parables, to make a point. So he'd give a story that wasn't necessarily true in order to make a point, all right? We do this all the time. So last weekend I preached on the parable of the lost sheep. And we looked at how the scripture shows us in Luke chapter 15 when, when Jesus is confronted by the Pharisees because he's sitting down with the tax collectors and sinners. And again, uh, to be called a tax collector is worse than being called a sinner. And so Jesus loves people so much that these tax collectors, these rejects of society, if you will, and these sinners are flocking to him because they want to experience the same love from him that they're seeing him show everyone else. And so last week we looked at the parable of the lost sheep, and what I tried to show you was that we need to, as Christians, be about our Father's business. And what I was trying to remind us of last weekend is that Easter is not just about all of our family match, you know, having matching clothes for our cool pictures and, and going to eat some good food at Grandma's house and then going and finding Easter eggs. Listen, those things are fine and they're fun, but the point of Easter is for us to remember and be reminded to be about our Father's business. And so I shared with you last week that we in the church world refer to Easter Sunday as the Super Bowl of Christianity. <laughs> and, and the reason we refer to, the, refer to it as that is because out of the 230 million Americans who claim to be Christians, on Easter Sunday next weekend, about 118 million people will attend a church service across our country. Now, how does that compare to this Sunday? Uh, this Sunday, across our country, about 54 million Americans will go to church. So next weekend, our attendance in this country is going to more than double. So what does that mean? That means there are a lot of broken people out there who are looking for answers, who are looking for purpose, who want to make a difference, who have not been brought into the family of God yet, that are going to show up to church next weekend, and we need to love them. So what I told you last weekend was, if next weekend is our Super Bowl, then this is our pregame speech. You're the team. You're going to be running the place. And what I wanted to do last week and this week is to, is to huddle us up, if you will, and say, okay, listen, church family, it, it's game time. Next weekend, we're going to have the greatest opportunity to reach your husband, to reach your son and daughter, to reach your coworker, to reach the people in this area who would never come to church otherwise. Next weekend is our greatest opportunity to go and get them and bring them and invite them. Why? So that they can hear the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. But listen, in order for us to do this, we, we have to understand and we have to be about our father's business as his sons and daughters. Because I don't know if you've noticed this yet or not, but for some reason, God has decided that the way he's going to change people's lives is through using his sons and daughters like us. So if you remove us, if we remove ourselves, if you will, from God's plan, then humanity doesn't have much hope. But instead, what our Father has done is say, listen, I'm going to change this world, and I'm inviting you, sons and daughters, to be a part of it. And if you don't want to be a part of it, I'll find somebody that will. And I don't know about you, but I want to be about my Father's business, and I want to reach people. I want to see more people pray to receive Christ. I want to see more marriages healed. I want to see more kids reciting Bible verses. I want to see more children raising their hands, worshiping the true King. I want to see more teenagers becoming leaders in their area and praising Jesus. Come on, somebody. Listen, that's what I want, but I, let me just tell you, if we as the sons and daughters don't get serious about being a part of the plan, if we don't get serious about going after the one and leaving the 99, then we won't be a part of those things that God is trying to do in and through our loved ones in our life and in this community. So again, my desire last week and this week was to get us pumped up. And if you could tell, I'm a little pumped up. So listen, the, the goal is for us to go, okay, Next weekend is going to be awesome. And, and here's the truth, church. Can I just, if we don't do nothing this week, if we don't do another thing this week, we're going to have tons of people show up next weekend. But listen, that's not good enough. I, I want to be a part of that. And to be like, for me as your pastor, here's what I'm thinking this week. I, I want to go invite people. 
Like, I want to go invite people because I want to experience the same thing some of you have experienced when you invite a loved one or a friend and you see them raise their hand when I lead them to Jesus. And that feeling that you get that, man, I got to be a part of something that's eternal and supernatural. May we never become numb to people praying to receive Christ. And I want to be a part of that just as much as you. And so today, with continuing with that theme of being about our Father's business, I I want us to continue with the next parable that we see from Jesus in Luke 15. All right, so I'm going to read this passage. Luke chapter 15, if you have your Bibles, we're going to pick it up in verse 8. Verse 8 this morning. We're only going to look at three verses this morning, three verses. So I'm going to read this, and then I'm going to pray. So again, this is Jesus. Last week, he he shared the parable of the lost sheep. He's talking to religious people who are giving him a hard time for loving people that society has written off. And these religious people are saying, why why are you eating with these sinners and these tax collectors? Why why are you dealing with them? And Jesus says, well, which one of you having a sheep wouldn't wouldn't leave the 99 to go and find the one? And then he continues. He he doesn't stop. He gives them one metaphor or parable. Then he's going to move into the next one. So he's just throwing jabs right here, all right? And we're going into the second part. He says, or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one, how many? One coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I lost. And just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one, everyone say one, who repents. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity to, to, to receive from your word. And God, I just pray over the next few moments that as we, as we dig into this passage, God, as we look at the one, as we discuss the lost coin, God, I pray it stirs something inside of us, a, an urgency, if you will, God, to, to glorify you by going and reaching those that you paid a price for. So God, I just pray that you would use us this morning, speak to us, and Holy Spirit, I invite you into, in, into this moment to use my words to build and encourage your people. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. All right, so verse 8. Or what woman having ten coins, silver coins, by the way, silver is important, um, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp to go and sweep the house until she finds it. So I want to talk about the coin for a moment. Now, this is just a nickel that I found in my truck (laughs) this morning on the way to church. It's just a nickel, all right? But I want to talk about the coin in this passage for a little bit because I need you to understand how important this coin is. Because some of you are thinking, well, it's just a coin. I mean, right? How many of us, we walk by pennies and nickels all the time on the ground. A lot of us do that, right? But now if we see a quarter, that's a different story. But if we see a penny or a nickel, we walk past it. So it's just a coin, Zach. But you, you have to understand in context here how important this coin is to this lady. So during this time in history, this coin, this silver coin represented a day's wage for this woman. A day's wage. And the the passage says, the parable says that she only had 10. So she just lost 10% of all of her money. Could you imagine waking up tomorrow and 10% of your savings is gone? Could you imagine waking up and 10% of your checking is gone? Some of you are like, well, yeah, Zach, that's my month every Monday right there. Okay, okay, but you, you know the feeling then, what, what it's like to lose something like that. And so the, the point of this passage and showing us the coin is not only is it 10% of all she owns, during this time in history, oftentimes for a woman, they would wear a coin, this silver coin, around their neck on a necklace. And the reason they would do that is because this was like a dowry, if you will. It was very, very sentimental to them. In fact, there were laws during this time that a tax collector could not come and make you pay wages on what you owed with this silver coin if it was that dowry that you had. So all that to say, not only is this a day's wage for this woman, that this coin could have been very, very sentimental to her. So now she loses this coin and she does everything she can to go and find the coin. Now listen, I need you to understand something. The the point of this parable and this metaphor is not that it's just one coin. The point of the metaphor is not that you are just one person among seven billion. The point of the parable is that the coin has value and means something to the person who has lost it. So here's the first point this morning. I only got two today. The first point this morning is every human life has value. Every human life has value to God. 
It means something to him. This is why Jesus is talking about the one sheep. It's why he's talking about the one coin, because every life has value to him. And I know some of you are sitting here today, well, I, Zach, I don't, I don't feel that valued. Like, I, I, I'm not worth much. I'm, I'm not really good for anything. I'm always picked last. Like, you, you don't know my story, Zach. I just haven't, I didn't come from a lot. I'm probably not headed towards much. Like, my life just doesn't have as much value, Zach, as others do. And I would argue with you that is not what the Bible says, and that is not what your spiritual father says about you. In fact, the scripture says in Luke chapter 12, it says, Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, even the hairs on your hair head are all numbered. Think about that for a moment. Even God has the hairs on your head numbered. He knows the intimate details, church, of your life. And here's what it finishes with. Fear not. You are of more value than many sparrows. So here's the point. Listen, if God doesn't even lose track of sparrows, I mean, come on, we could have picked a different animal here, right? Like a majestic elephant or something, right? No, he picks a sparrow, all right? I'm pretty sure the world could do without a few more sparrows. You, you tracking with me on this? And this is the point the Bible is making. If God is keeping track of the sparrows, how much more is he keeping track of you? You are of more value. Why? Because you are created in his image. The sparrow is not. You are created in the image of your heavenly father. Your life absolutely has value. Well, Zach, that sounds great, but I still, I still don't think my life has value. Well, listen, your value, I love this right here. Your value is not determined by you. Why don't you think about this for a moment? The value of your life has not been determined by you. It has been, term, been determined by a God who is willing to pay for it. So the value of something, now I want you to think about this, the value of something is determined based off of what someone is willing to pay for it. Right? I don't know if you've ever seen one of these paintings where it looks like just like my four-year-old just grabbed some paint and threw at it and it's like worth a billion dollars. You know what I'm talking about? You know why it's worth a billion dollars? Because someone's willing to pay that for it. So listen, your life, friend, no matter how insignificant you feel, is of worth value because your God was willing to give his son for your life. Think about that for a moment. I love thinking about the cross. I love thinking about Jesus and the sacrifice. Because if you think about it, God has determined, despite what society says about your life, despite what your parents said about your life, God has determined that your life is of value, and he loved you so much, and you are so valuable to him that he sent Jesus, his son, to die on the cross for you. That's where your value comes from, church. Not how much money you have, not how much talent you have or lack. Your value has been determined by the buyer. And, and church, here's the thing. Every human life has value. Because I don't know what you're thinking. Well, Zach, that sounds great, but what about this person over here? I don't really like them. They've done some horrible things. And, and what about this girl over here? She continues to give in to drug addiction and all these. Listen, every life has value to Jesus. Every single life has value. In fact, there's a story in a book. In the, in the name of the book, I want to give it to you. The, the name of the book is called, And He Told Them a Story. And it's about the parables of Jesus. And it was written by Richard Hoffler. And in this book... He really captures how much every life means to Jesus. And in this book, he tells a story where there's this teenager who just got his driver's license. He's got this nice hot rod, all right, and he's, he's driving down the street, and he's absolutely not going the speed limit. He's putting this thing to the test. He's driving extremely fast. He loses control, hits a curb, goes, flips in the air, and hits a little girl and kills her. Once the teenager crawls out of this car, he looks over and he sees the body of the little girl. He realizes what's just happened. So out of fear, he runs. And he runs into the hills. And the sheriff's department shows up and, and they, they're looking at the crash and what happened. Can't find the driver. And then they see a trail of blood. And, and, the, and the teenage boy had been hurt. And so they go and follow this blood trail until a mine shaft. And this teenager had went into the mine shaft, but it had collapsed when he went in there. So now you've got all these, these sheriff department and this crowd staying around looking. You've got reporters, and, and they're trying to get this teenager out of there, but the hole is so tight that the sheriff and the department can't get in there. So there's this man in the crowd who's real skinny and small, and he climbs in there and gets the boy and brings him out. As he brings the boy out, the reporter looks at the man and recognizes him as the little girl's father. And the reporter goes over and says, Sir, 
how could you do this? And the man, just being real honest, begins to respond to the reporter. He says, you know what, if, if I'm just honest, I, I wanted him to die in there. Because he deserved it for taking the life of my little girl. But then I heard his cries, and then in a moment I realized that Jesus died for him too. Jesus died for him too. Church, that's the attitude we're to have. That's what it's like to have the heart of the Father. It's to look at someone that, that we would say doesn't deserve it and say, you know what? Neither did I. And so they deserve the love of Christ just as much as I do. Let's go and point them to Jesus. That's the point. He represents the lost coin. And to gain the heart of our Heavenly Father is to care about everyone in this town, in this area, in your job, in your school, despite the choices that they have made and are making, we need to love and care for them enough that we are searching for the coin. Why? Because they have value when it comes to our Heavenly Father. Every human life has value. And not only that, we'll finish with this point. Every human life belongs to God. So, so if every human life, well, listen to this, if every human life has value because God has determined that our life was worth sending his son. That's the ultimate price, by the way, church. To, to give your life for someone else is the ultimate price that you can pay out of love for someone else. And Jesus did that for us creation. So because he did that for us, our life has value. And not only that, our life also, every human life belongs to God. I love this saying right here. Listen to this. Th this was a revelation for me. There are not lost sinners out there. There are lost possessions. Your husband, your coworker, the people in your school, your boss, these people that don't know Jesus, they're not lost sinners. They're lost possessions because Jesus came to die on the cross for them so that they can be welcomed into the family of God. That's what we were designed for. We were designed to be in a relationship with our Heavenly Father and welcomed in to His spiritual family. That is not lost sinners out there. Sure, they're sinners. I'm not arguing that. The point is they belong to God. Can we go and get them and bring them to God? That's the point, friends. That's the point. Let me read this verse for you out of Matthew. Matthew chapter 28 says this, even as the Son of Man. Now, the Son of Man in Scripture is referring to Jesus. Okay, that was another term uh, to, to talk about Jesus. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. If you have your Bibles, I want you to circle that ransom. Matthew 20, 28. Here's what ransom means. It means a consideration paid or demanded for the release of someone or something from ca captivity. It's the release of someone or something from captivity captivity so when the bible says that jesus came to, to not to not to be served but to serve and to be a ransom for our life here's what he's saying guys jesus came to pay the price for the one sheep he came to pay the price for the one coin he came to pray the pay the ransom what does the ransom mean the ransom re refers to the bondage that you are you and i are in for our sins now we all in this room would be willing to admit that we've sinned we've made a mistake we've messed up at some point in our life Agreed? Can we all just, yes, we all would be willing to do that. Well, here's the thing, church, because we've messed up, whether we've messed up once or a billion times, there, there has to be consequences for that sin. And the judge, our God, our Heavenly Father, who is perfect and just, has to do something with that sin. There is a ransom on your life when you are not a Christian, which means somebody has to pay the price for your sin. And as a lost person, if you're not willing to say, Jesus, I received the fact that you have paid the price for my life, then at some point, you're going to have to pay that ransom. So here's what I love. Jesus comes in and pays the ransom. Jesus comes in and says, okay, Father, I'll pay their debt. Father, I'll pay the debt that they can't pay. I'll come in and I will give my life for theirs. In fact, today is referred to as Palm Sunday. Do you know that? Palm Sunday. Let me, let me tell you what that means. Palm Sunday, and here's the reason we call it Palm Sunday. It was the last Sunday. It was the Sunday that Jesus came into Jerusalem on the donkey. So Jesus fulfills the Old Testament prophets. By the way, it was prophesied in the Old Testament over 700 years before he did this that Jesus would come into Jerusalem, into Zion. He came in on a donkey. When he came in, the people knew what he was claiming. 
And as he came in, they were laying palms on the ground in front of him, and they were taking their jackets off. The scripture calls it cloaks. Their cloaks off and laying them on the ground. So palms and jackets are laying on the ground. He's getting the royal treatment. That's what they would do for royalty. And as he was ushering in, as he was walking in on that donkey, they were screaming and chanting, Hosanna, Hosanna. See, the reason that they were, they were chanting Hosanna is because Hosanna means that we've been liberated. It means the ransom has finally come. So when Jesus was coming in on that donkey church, here's what he's saying. When they were, when they were chanting Hosanna, I've come for you. In 2019 in Graham, Texas, I came for Susie. I, I came for Zach. I came for Sydney. I came for John. When he was ushering in on that donkey and as they were screaming, Hosanna, he knew the very statement that he was making. He was coming to say, for all those that would accept him, I have come to pay the ransom. I have come for the one sheep. I have come for the one coin. I have come to bring life and healing to those that are broken and lost. And that's why we celebrate Palm Sunday. Because it wasn't too long after that, that's exactly what he would do. They would arrest him, beat him, torture him, nail him to that cross, and then three days later, which we'll celebrate next weekend, he'll walk out of that tomb alive where he now, everyone say now, sits at the right hand of the Father. As I, I'll close with this. Right now, um, uh, Arrow, my son, if you don't know, I have a four-year-old little boy, his name's Arrow. And uh, we have our bedtime routine, and, and Miranda takes one night, I'll take the next night, and we'll put the kids down. And so here recently, um, Arrow loves to read Bible stories. And so we have these kid Bibles by his bed. And by the way, parents, let me tell you, you need to get on this. If you don't have a kid Bible by your bed and read them a short story before they go to bed, you are missing out on good soil to start throwing seed. So right now, my son's asking a lot of questions about Jesus. And so he, his favorite story right now in that book is, is for me to flip to the part of the Bible. And it's, it's got this illustration. It's got Jesus with this cross on his back. And you can see where they beat him with that cat of nine tails. And you can see the blood. And as I'm looking at this, I'm like, man, this is a little intense for a four-year-old. But then I realized, you know what, it's necessary, though. It's necessary. Because my son's either going to get his theology from home or he's going to get it from culture. So he, he always wants to go to Jesus, and he, he understands, or he, he can repeat that he knows that they killed him, and he, he doesn't know why. Shoot. <laughs> so I'm, I'm there, like, I'm trying to tell this story, and I find myself always having to tell him the good news. Like, I, I find myself like, no, listen, because he gets sad. He gets sad that they killed Jesus because he knows that Jesus loves him. And so I'm always bringing back, oh, listen, Arrow, the reason he did that, and then you flip over the next page, it has Jesus hanging on the cross. And I flip over the next page, and I'm like, look, you know, Jesus died on the cross because he loves Arrow, and he loves Daddy, and he loves Mommy, and he loves Sissy. So he, he died on that cross, but, and then my son gets sad. And this it's like, we do this like every night. And so then I love flipping to the next page. Because then the next page is an empty tomb. And I say, that arrow, Jesus is alive. Like, he's alive right now. They killed him, but he, like, he's alive right now, and he loves you. And so now we'll ask Arrow, is Jesus alive or dead? He'll say, he's alive. Now, is he saved? Is, is my son saved? I don't think he is yet, but that that's beside the point. I love telling the story. Jesus loved the one so much that he's willing to give his life. And because he gave his life, church, your life has value, my life has value, and every single person out there, whether they believe in God or not, whether they hate the church or not, despite what their story is, their life has value. And God desires for them to be a part in this spiritual family. So here's the question for you today. Can we be about our Father's business this week? Can we go and be about our Father's business and invite our neighbors, invite our coworkers, invite our family members, invite our loved ones to come to church next weekend so that they can hear about their value, so that they can hear about a God that loved them so much that he gave his life for them. Can we be about our Father's business? Let me pray for you this morning.
God, thank you again for the opportunity, God, just to, to open your word. And God, I pray for all of us in this room that, that the parable of the lost sheep, the, the parable of the lost coin, God, I pray that it's spoken to our hearts. God, right now, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would begin to to seal this in the hearts of all of us, that we would become a people that are about our Father's business, that there's a sense of urgency about our life, that there's this urgency inside of us to go and invite and love people, and and maybe not just invite them to church, but for some of us, God, if if they have the courage and the strength to actually share the gospel with them, to tell them about Jesus and what Jesus has done to their life. But God, whatever it looks like, I just desire for us to be a church that is so passionate about the one, despite how far they are from you. God, I just pray we'd be passionate about the one. And that we would search, that we would look, that we would make efforts until we find them and bring them into your presence. So as we go throughout this week, God, give us strength. Give us the courage to walk over and invite our neighbors. Give us the courage to invite our boss and our coworkers. Give our teenagers courage that when they're in school, say, hey, won't you come to church with me? Come check this out. And God, we pray for all those people that are going to show up next weekend, God, that for those that don't have a relationship with you, that next weekend would be the week that they realize their value and that they accept the love that you have shown them. So God, we lift that up to you and we thank you. Jesus' name.